11.30. How we doing? Yeah. Oh, man, let's go. This is great. So I, I've had just a little bit of Red Bull this morning. We'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm super excited, really excited, actually, to be honest with you, because we are studying today the book of Exodus, uh, second book in the Bible. Last week we studied what? Genesis, since it's the first book in the Bible, makes sense. We're in Exodus now, second book, and check this out. How many of you got one of these programs when you came in? Anybody got a program? All right, cool, check it out. Now, next one is, inside the program is a three-hole punch insert. Isn't that dandy? And on that three-hole punch insert, there are fill-in-the-blanks, and my promise to you all of 2024 is to make sure that you have all blanks filled. And it's a great journey and a great discipline for me to do this with you. So, if you haven't yet and you want to, you can go into the shop and you can even get a free ring binder that you can put these in. And at the end of the year, you'll have 66 quick notes on the entire book of the Bible. How cool is that? Awesome. We believe that God changes lives through the word, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, man, I got I to gotta get ready. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. I'm really excited. If I talk a little fast, let's blame it on the Red Bull. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, we just want to say thank you uh, for everything that you're doing in this place. Uh, just spending time with you daily is amazing, but when we get together with, with other people who just want to chase after you, it's powerful. And so thank you so much for this gathering that we have together. We pray a very special blessing over every family in the room, over every married couple, every child, every single. God, we know that you're doing great things in all of our lives. In your name we pray, all God's people say it. Amen. 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 All right, so we talked about how Exodus is the second book of 66 in the Bible. Exodus is written by a man named Moses. Now, Moses, I love studying Moses. Moses had some attitude. He had some personality. This guy was legit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick Red Bull background <laughs> on the author Moses before we go on. Are you ready? Here's a quick background. All right. Moses was born during the time that Pharaoh gave the order for the sons to be thrown into the river. So his mother hid him in a floating basket in the reeds by the riverbank with his sister posted nearby to make sure he didn't sink into the water. When Pharaoh's daughter was going to bathe in the river, she noticed the floating basket, opened it up, and there was little Momo belting out an adorable little cry. Pharaoh's daughter noticed little Mo was a little Hebrew baby, and this is where Moses' sister had an instantaneous clever idea to ask Pharaoh's daughter if she would like a Hebrew woman to nurse the little Mo and keep him healthy. Pharaoh's daughter said yes, so Moses' sister ran and grabbed Moses' mother, and they lived in Egypt growing up in royalty under Pharaoh's rule. But wait, there's more. Moses is a Hebrew, and all the Hebrews are slaves. One day Moses saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew slave. Momo had seen enough and said no, no, then killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Pharaoh found out and ordered Moses to be killed, and that's when Moses ran. Then what we do is we find Moses in the backfield of his father-in-law's land as a shepherd. So we've got this murdering shepherd now in the land of his father-in-law. And this is where the story kind of gets interesting. So I want to give you, before we get to that, I want to give you just a little bit background of Exodus. The type of book that Exodus is, it's a history book about the Hebrews. The data writing is somewhere in between 1446 and 1406 BC. The reason why we know that is because that's about the time that the 10 plagues happened in Egypt. And so that marks the moment that uh, this book was born. All right. So I've studied the book of Exodus, but one of the verses in the book of Exodus is my absolute favorite verses on the planet. It's found in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. Here's what it says. The key verse is Exodus 6, verse 7. It says, I will claim you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the oppression in Egypt. And I want you to hear something this morning, church. I believe with all of my heart that the scripture that was written in Exodus is for us right now today. God has claimed you as his people and he wants you to have a relationship with him and he will be your God and you can have peace every single day knowing he is in control. Can I get a amen? amen? I love this verse. There's so much power in it. I wish I could just preach on that today, but we got a few other things we got to cover. Here's the big idea of Exodus. 
The big idea is Exodus is that God saves his people from slavery. Now, 1130, you're going to like this the way that I twisted this. I'm going to throw a little, throw a little chocolate on this. Here you go. So, what he's doing is he's saving people from slavery. However, what it means is it means that people are getting free. Amen. See, Exodus is a book of freedom. I was a slave one time. God shows up, and now I'm free. Can anybody resonate with a story like that in your life? Amen. Yeah, that's why Exodus is going down today. Because here's the deal. God saves his people from slavery, and it is so applicable to us today. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Moses said something to the people that was dynamic, needed, and they understood it. And I want to repeat it for us this morning because it's just as dynamic for us. It's just as needed, and the people under, and you're going to understand this. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still. Can someone say amen? amen. Do not be afraid, stand still. Let's just be really honest and throw it all out on the table today. The world is... It's a difficult world to live in. We have the highs of highs that we see. We have the lows of lows. We have circumstances that are foggy that we don't know how we're going to get to. And we always wonder how it's going to end up. But here's what we know. We know that we can stand still and not be afraid when we're rolling through this life with God. Amen? Amen. And that's what makes this so awesome about the verse for today. Because this verse is calling us to once again believe in the God who delivered the slaves out of Egypt. And he tore it up when he did it. He kept them safe. He kept them at peace. He made sure that they got to the promised land. And I want you to know that God is doing the same with your life today. You are going to get to the destination that he has planned for you. You can take that to the bank. I'm going to fire it up. Maybe it's a red bull. I don't know. Holy Spirit. Okay, so it says stand still and free the salvation and see the salvation of the Lord, which he has accomplished for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and shall hold your peace. If you know that the Lord is fighting on your behalf this morning, raise your hand. Raise your other hand and say bye-bye worries. Bye-bye worries. All right, there you go. So what I want to do is I want to just give you six simple events that we find in Exodus. Because Exodus is loaded with some incredible stuff that we've heard about, maybe studied about. But we're going to take a little closer look, all right? So number one. We're going to talk a little bit about the burning bush. How many of you heard about the burning bush? Yeah, all right, all over this place. How many of you had bushes burned on your property? Anybody? Okay, cool, that's weird. But here's the thing. So there's this burning bush, and God sends Israel a deliverer through this burning bush. Let's go to the story in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 reads like this. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from amidst a bush. So he looked, and behold, and the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned to look, God called him from amidst the bush and said, Moses, Moses, I want you to put your, yourself in Moses' shoes for a minute. You're tending sheep in the back land of your father-in-law's land. You see a bush that looks like it's on fire, but it's not. It's not burning up. And then the bush starts talking to you. How many of you at that point are just like, what was in what I ate? Right? So Moses, what's interesting about this is as the bush is talking to Moses, the Bible says, then Moses said. Now Moses is talking back to the bush. This is an interesting day, y'all. When you're reading this, it's like, wow. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn up. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called him from, from inside, said, Moses, Moses. And then, this is what Moses says. He says, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near to the place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I want to hit you with a question, because it's church and we have fun. What was your burning bush moment? What is it that God is coming to you with today and calling you forward into? What is it that he's asking you to join him in doing? What is it that, that he, he wants you to respond to and engage and, and lead 
others to freedom. What is your burning bush moment? Because we all have a burning bush moment. God is coming to us, and he's speaking something to you. His desire is that we respond the same way that Moses responded. Re Moses responded with these words. He said, here I am. I ought to respond like that to God on a daily, huh? Hey, I want you to go to St. Cloud and preach the gospel. Here I am. Hey, I want you to go and talk to some people that don't look, talk, or act like you. Here I am. Hey, I want you to keep on smiling at people on the street, make them wonder what you got. Here I am. I want you to show those broken teeth off. Here I am. <laughs> What's your burning bush moment? Because what we need to understand is we need to understand that when God chooses us for somebody else's freedom, we also see our own frailty, don't we? Amen. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? See, God is leading you into greater paths. He's leading you to deliver freedom to somebody. But it's not going to be easy because you're going to recognize so quickly just how frail you are. And you're going to identify the fact that, let's be honest, we're pretty weak. We need something to stand on. What are we going to stand on as we help lead other people to freedom? Well, there's only one thing that is sturdy enough that we can stand on, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, it's his strength that comes into our lives, propelling us forward so that other people can find freedom. I believe that St. Cloud is going to be the freest place on the planet where other cities are going to wonder what's wrong with St. Cloud. I believe that freedom is going to be the anthem in 2024. I believe that freedom is going to call people forward. I believe that freedom is going to impact families like it never has. I believe that freedom is going to impact neighbors like it never has. I believe that freedom is going to fill the seats of this church, not because we want a full church, but because we want free people. Amen. I believe in freedom. Man, aren't we frail? Man, we need Jesus. Some of you are already like, man, I see you need Jesus, bro. <laughs> and you're right, I need Jesus. Another event that we see in the book of Exodus is when God actually explains his name for the first time. So number two, you've got this, this, this interesting thing that we've seen over and over and over, Yahweh. He says, he says I am. Think about that. If, I, if, if you were to introduce yourself to me at, at church and you say, hey, you know, I'm James. Hey, I am. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, you are. <laughs> Do you see those Red Bull reflexes? <laughs> oh, yeah. Exodus 3, 13 and 14. It says, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel... And say to them, the God of your forefathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What was God trying to let Moses know? He was trying to let Moses know that I am above all. There is no one else above me. I am. And so Moses was rolling with some serious authority. He wasn't rolling with weakness. He was rolling with I am. He was rolling with the one that has never been created. Last week in Genesis, we talked about how God always has been. No one created him. Aren't you excited this morning as a believer that you serve a God who hasn't been created by anything? He is. Like, oh, God, you are. You are all I need. What would the world look like if we were just like, you're all I need? And we relied on him for everything. Man, I tell you what, freedom is when you realize that there is a larger, larger God out there other than yourself. How do you find freedom? I'm not. You are. So then what happens? No, that's, that's good. It's number three. Thank you. I worked on that for you. <laughs> so number three, 
we come to this idea of the ten plagues, but I need to give you a little backstory as to why we have the ten plagues. You guys having fun? Yeah. yeah. I can tell. You think so. <laughs> so we come to this story of the ten plagues, but I want to give you a background. So what happened was Moses went to Pharaoh, and he said, hey, by the way, Pharaoh, uh, Mr. Ruler, God told me that you need to let his people out of slavery, and they need to follow me. And Pharaoh was like, no. So then God was like, all right, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Pharaoh know who's really in charge. So then what God does is he sends the ten plagues. And for number three, for your fill in the blank, God conquers Egypt and its false demon gods. God conquers Egypt and its false demon gods. But listen to how God did this. See, he wanted them to know that they were worshiping false demons. And so what he did was he used the plagues against their demonic belief. So the god of Osiris that, that Egypt worshipped, that was the demon of the, the god of Nile, of the Nile. That's, that's what they, they, they knew what, who, who Osiris was. And so what God did was he like, okay, you've heard of Osiris. Well, check this out. I'm going to turn your water into blood. What that shows is that shows that I am who sent that guy that you don't want the people to leave with is bigger than your demon god, Osiris. Then he sends frogs. How many of you would love it if, like, from border to border, it was just constant frogs? Everywhere you stepped, everywhere you laid your head, even when you went to the bathroom, you sat on frogs. That's the kind of plague that God sent to Egypt. Wall to wall, frogs. Another one he sent was uh, flies. And there's another translation that says it's actually gnats. And here's, let me, let me break it down. It wasn't like, oh, a gnat. It was a plague of gnats to where if you were walking around outside and you talked, it was like a vacuum of gnats going <laughs> into your mouth and you couldn't speak. Yeah. That was the plague. Yeah. He sent boils. He sent hail. He sent locusts. He sent darkness. And when it says darkness, I'm talking about darkness and if you put your hand in front of your face, you couldn't see. And he sent the death of the firstborn. Now, God wanted them to understand that your demon gods always fall to the real God. Okay, why do I mention this? Because right now in our world, there are some really interesting things happening. There are some really interesting people. There are some really interesting circumstances. There are some bizarre occurrences. And we could look at it and be like, ah, oh, you know, it's just kind of bizarre, whatever, it's a one-off. But what we're seeing is we're seeing more than ever before demonic activity. Demons are just running wild right now. They're just running out in broad daylight. And they're, they're doing things that are so destructive and people are responding to it. Not because they're terrible people. People are great. They're loved by God. But it's the demon force on the inside of them causing them to do the things they're doing. And this is what Egypt worshipped. They worshipped the demons, God. They invited the demonic into their lives. And God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you that I'm over that stuff. See, we live in a world right now that needs to understand that there is demonic activity that's flying off the charts. And how do we respond to that? We respond with the mighty name of Jesus, making sure that those little minions don't know that they can harm our lives anymore. They need to know you can't harm our lives. You can't touch us. You know, the, you know those tough situations that are so tempting just to open the door and be like, I quit. That's the moment that a demon goes, got him. Instead of saying, I quit. Say, God goes. And where he goes, I go. I follow him. I want you to know that in many of your 2024s, including my own 2024, I want you to know that you're going to face some activity that is not physical, it's spiritual, and you need to speak back to it through the scriptures that we're learning, that in the mighty name of Jesus, demons need to flee. Maybe someone in this room right now, you need to be identified and set loose right now in the mighty name of Jesus to have a demon come out of your body so you can be free. Amen. You know that addiction that you've been struggling with that you just can't quite get rid of? Is it demonic? I don't know. <laughs> Let's find out. They can't tread upon the waters of Christ. So God sent ten plagues. Let them know who the God was. Then we get to this other event, the Passover. And what we realize in, in the Passover is that God passes over 
those marked with the blood of the Lamb. All right. I need to give you a little background as to why this is so important. So here's what God did. He came to Moses and he said, hey, Moses, I need you to have the people get a lamb that is one year old and it needs to be without defect and without blemish. And here's the instructions on what to do with that lamb. You are to make sure that you slaughter the lamb, but you need to do it without breaking a single bone. So no bones can be broken. And then what you need to do is you need to set aside the blood and then put the lamb on the oven or on the fire, and then you consume the lamb. Then what you do is you grab the blood and you put it over the doorpost and on the sides of the door. And here's why this is important for you to understand, Moses. God was telling Moses, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt and all of the doors that have the blood of the lamb, I'm going to pass over that and that home will receive peace, it will receive safety, and it will be saved. But all of the doors that do not have the blood of the lamb that are on it will receive judgment and death. What he said was he said that every firstborn child and animal living in the home that is without the blood will perish. What does that sound like? It sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? It sounds like if we're covered by the blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ, we're saved with peace. But if you don't have the blood of the Lamb, you receive judgment. Is that seriously kicking in all right? Man, I got some time, bro. So here's the deal. What he's saying is he's saying that the blood needs to be on the doors and the, do and, and the, and the doorposts. What I think is really cool that if you if you kind of if you kind of look into this a little bit, when blood drips from the door, from the top and from the sides, it almost forms a cross. It almost would would resemble a cross. I think that God was showing Moses in Exodus, the blood of the lamb is going to be slain on a cross. Amen. I think that's what he was doing. I think he was showing his his creative his creative nature and that he exists outside the confines of time. See. We need the blood of Christ in order to be saved. Amen? Amen? Number five, we get to another event. And this is the parting of the Red Sea. God saves his people as they pass through the water. So, how many of you are fishermen in place? If the water is parted, how many of you would throw your line into the wall of water? That's you, right? Okay. So what, what happened was, Pharaoh eventually let the Hebrews out of Egypt, out of slavery. Because it impacted his own household with the plagues. So Pharaoh was like, get out of here, man. I don't know what you brought with you, but I don't want it in this area. So the, the Israelites or the Hebrews made their way to the Red Sea, and there was nowhere to go. But behind them, what they heard was very dangerous, because what happened was Pharaoh decided that he wasn't going to let them go. He's like, hey, guys, rally up. I hate those dudes. Let's go slaughter them. So Pharaoh's army comes in behind the Hebrews, and, and the Hebrews are beginning to hear the different chariots, and, and they're hearing the screams and the chanting of war, and they go to Moses, listen to this, the Hebrews go to Moses, and they say, Moses, what are we going to do? And Moses goes to God, and the Bible says in Exodus, he went to God, and he said, hey, listen to the response that God gives Moses. Why didn't you come to me? And then he says this. Just move forward. Water. Can't move forward. You know what I think God was saying? Take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. You ever get to that moment in your life where it feels like things are blocking off and it's like one roadblock after another after another and you're going, oh my goodness, what's with the obstacles? Just me? All right. I think what God is saying is he's saying, you know when you encounter those? Take a step of faith. Step through the obstacle that you think is holding you up. And what do we say all the time? I don't know how. 
You know what you do when you don't know what to do? You just do the next right thing. That's all you do. One foot in front of the other. Okay, so all of these, he, all these Egyptians are coming in on, on the Hebrews. And so Moses is like, okay, Lord. So the Lord tells him to take his staff, wave it over the sea, and take, take his hand and wave it. And he does, and then all of a sudden the waters go. <laughs> and Moses is like, cool party trick. All right. So then what happens is the Bible says that about 500,000 men begin to pass through. It doesn't talk about women and children. Listen, there could have been up to 2 million people walking on dry land through the Red Sea. Which, by the way, you can go to the site today in the Holy Land where they have pillars set up where they think they cross over. It's pretty cool. Okay. So then they all get on the other side. Can't you imagine just a little boy who, who's just all curious and he kind of he kind of looks around the wall of the water and he goes, Mom, the Egyptians are still coming. And I can just see little heads peering and seeing the Egyptians rolling through the dry land. God does something amazing. He just folds the envelope. Egyptians obliterated. It's absolutely incredible to think about the love that God has for people when they need freedom. Isn't that something? Well, God loves us all the time. I know, but there's something fresh about freedom when it comes to God. He wants all to be set free. Okay. So we talked about a few events. Let's go ahead and let's talk about Jesus in Exodus. Really? Jesus is in the book of Exodus? Yes. And this is going to be fun for you. And I've only got two and a half minutes left. Here we go. <laughs> Red Bull moment. Number one. Jesus is the God in the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, we already talked about it. He said, when they ask who sent you, say I am. We fast forward to John chapter 8 in the New Testament. Jesus is speaking. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, hey, I'm the guy that you were talking to in the burning bush. That was me. I am. You're welcome. Well, how do we know that to be true? Because all throughout the New Testament, there's basically seven phrases Jesus says over and over and over again. Here we go. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He is. Amen. Hallelujah. And you stick in with the I am, and he will deliver you to freedom. Amen. Because he is. So Jesus was in the burning bush. Number two, Jesus is our Passover lamb. We already talked about it. The blood of Christ sets us free. Is there any people who have been set free in the house today? Yeah, you can make a little bit of money. Can I just tell you right now that heaven's not going to be quiet? It's like, oh, we got to heaven. Come with your music. Yeah. It's all right. If you've been set free, you can, you, you can say it, spray it, wheel it, and deal it, and make people feel it. That's okay. Because people need to know where you found your freedom. The blood of Christ. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Number three, Jesus gives us grace instead of rules of stone. Aren't you thankful that you walk with a relational Jesus? He desires to have a relationship with you. He's a God who wants to do life with you. So all we need to do is we need to wrap this up with applying it. Number one, the first thing we need to realize is that we all need deliverance. Because we all have sin. Number two. Jesus is our deliverer. You can't sit in a twisted pose chanting the right thing to get deliverance. I don't even know why people do that. You can't go to the rightest person on the planet to get deliverance. You know who you need to go to? Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. And we get our deliverance. Number three, uh, we need the blood of Jesus over our lives. Like Israel put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, we need the blood of Jesus over our lives. First Peter 1, 18 through 19 talks about that. Number four, we pass through the water of baptisms as a, simple, uh, as a symbol of new life. How many of you in the room have been baptized? How many of you want to be baptized today? We can do that. We got shorts, shirts, towels, and a pastor that likes to hold people underwater. <laughs> Not long, we bring you back up. If you see Jesus tap my shoulder, don't be back. But, listen, I remember as an eight-year-old boy, when I went down into the water, there was like this tension as I was going down. And, and it's almost like God was taking my old self 
and pinning it to the bottom of the tent. And coming up, it was no longer tension, but complete freedom. Because he gave me a new life. Out with the old, in with the new. Maybe that's something that you want to start off 2024 with in January. Out with the old, in with the new. Maybe you know you need to get baptized today. I'm serious. We'll do it. Water's warm. It is because it's cold outside. <laughs> Number five. We rescue others caught in the slavery of sin. Like Moses rescued Israel. See, every single day we breathe, there's another person out there that desperately needs Jesus. And so let's use every breath that we have in our lungs while we have it to tell them who they need. We have a world that is hurting and going to hell. We need some Moses people. Some people are going to say, yeah, this isn't going to be the easiest journey in the world, but I trust in God. That's what we need. Last one that 